St. Peter Damien, a medieval monk and a reformer, a scholar, a priest, a cardinal, a doctor of the church, right? That guy did it all. He did it all back in the middle of the 11th century, right? That's the 1000s back in, he did it in France and Italy. He had this great insight for you about one's prayer life. I'm quoting a paraphrase here from Pastor Philip Fatiker. He says, if we who are many are one in Christ, each of us possesses the whole. Indeed, the various members of the church of Christ, being so united as to form a single body, the entire church may be regarded as mystically present in each individual. I'll say that again. If we who are many are one in Christ, each of us possesses the whole. Indeed, the various members of the church of Christ, being so united as to form a single body, the entire church may be regarded as mystically present in each individual. Now, if you're familiar with things of math and science, we might make an analogy here to the self-similarity of a fractal or a molecule. In philosophy, we might call this the essence or even the quiddity, if you had to take Latin in college. Quiddity is kind of a fun word to say. It's not terribly useful in everyday life, but it's kind of a fun word to say. And so what we hear is that our union with Jesus through faith and holy baptism is such that nothing can separate us from him, not death, not time, not distance, as St. Paul tells us in Romans, that wherever we go, there he is, in, with, and under us, we might say. And that's true for all other baptized believers. And then at any and every moment, we have access to him, as do other faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, he extends himself to us in our everyday lives. He extends himself fully to us in our everyday lives. And this is pretty wild, right? We're so identified with Jesus and he with us that as he says in John chapter 16, the spirit of truth will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Right? That's sort of a part two, a follow-up, a callback to what happens here in Mark chapter 6. The 12 disciples are sent with Jesus' authority in this historical moment we hear about. And then later, the Holy Spirit comes to all disciples across all moments of history. Now, something I've always found very strange in this gospel story, and I bet you do too, is verse 5. Jesus could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. Did their faithless resentment of him thwart his power? Is that how this works, right? If we're mean enough to God, we can defeat him? Well... In a word, no, that's, that's not what's going on here. They didn't defeat or overpower Jesus. Their unbelief or faithlessness rejected his gifts and refused to receive them, except for a few sick people. God's gifts cause in us and require from us altogether believing hearts, as Martin Luther puts it, in order to accept those gifts and their benefits. So what does Jesus do in the story? Well, he doesn't pout. He doesn't quit. He doesn't complain to the president of the synagogue, right? It was Jairus we heard about. Jesus keeps on moving, like that old Impressions and Curtis Mayfield song. God's mission will most emphatically not be hamstrung or held back, prevented or thwarted by human schemes, doubts, and willfulness. Jesus shows his disciples that it's time to go to the next town, where others are straining and dying to hear his words of grace. Now, for most of us, this sounds really strange, since we've always known of Jesus, and his life and times hold very little novelty for us. Now, on your green study and share sheets, uh, question number six uh, rephrases that issue for people like us today. Uh, like those in his hometown, we think that we know him too well, 
that nothing is really supposed to happen around him, or at least nothing that will cause us to question our own comforts and commitments, our cozy, comfy, personal box seats in the house. Well, as C.S. Lewis famously wrote in his Narnia books, Aslan the lion is not a tame lion, and neither is the lion of Judah. So instead, Jesus doubles down. He magnifies his reach by sending his 12 disciples out into the surrounding towns. He bypasses these faithless ones who take offense at his gospel, which restores and heals God's human creatures. See, ministry is always a coalition of the willing, and it grows by addition. So Jesus adds his 12 disciples to his authority, or if you prefer, adds his authority to his 12 disciples, who then add territory to God's coming kingdom, because that's what the word gospel means at its root. It's the herald, the glad tidings that here comes the king with his kingdom. In this case, nothing less than the kingdom of heaven that conquers sin, death, and the devil through the cross with forgiveness and new life and salvation. We're spending a few Sundays in this preaching series called The Power of God, as we hear about the power of God present in Jesus and in his name. And we've noted before that very quickly in the gospel, the crowds around Jesus notice that he speaks and acts in a new way with power and authority that's not shared by the other rabbis or the religious powers that be. They realized That in a new and authentic way, to come into contact with Jesus was to come into contact with God himself, even if they couldn't quite put that into words. Now, of course, as readers of the gospel all these years later, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know what the crowds still have to figure out, that Jesus is God's son, that he is God in the flesh with all the power and authority that entails. Particularly in St. Mark's Gospel, Jesus does this weird thing where he tells folks that he is healed to not tell others about the healing. Now, is this a little bit of clever marketing and reverse psychology from Jesus? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Jesus seems to be more concerned with what we'll hear in just a few Sundays at his great miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, that the crowd will confuse all the commotion with the kingdom and its message of reconciliation and restoration. See, Jesus' miracles served this purpose. They are instances of people being restored and reconciled to God and to the community of God's people and to God's way of life, summed up in the great commandments to love God, to love neighbor, to love one another. And so this gets to the heart of the issue. Or as Jesus phrases it in Mark chapter 2, which is easier To say your sins are forgiven, or to say stand up, take your mat, and walk. Sometimes I think we modern folks feel left out, because we don't get to say take up your mat and walk. We don't get to anoint with oil for immediate healing. We don't get to cast out demons. And Pastor Tim and I have a friend, uh, Phil, who really is an exorcist. I'm not joking. You don't want any share of that. Be glad that you don't get to do that one. But we miss the greater part. Your sins are forgiven. This is the core of our faith. The apostolic witness, the kerygma. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. You are reconciled to God and restored to his people. And by this divine action, we are brought into his kingdom and its mission extends to and through us. Yes, through baptism, we are incorporated into the beloved, believing body of Christ. We are so united with him as a part to the whole and the whole to the part, as we heard from St. Peter Damien earlier, that by the Holy Spirit, what is his is declared to us. The message to repent and to believe the good news in Jesus' name that we have forgiveness, new life, and salvation. Therefore, we have all of the authority to forgive as we have been forgiven just as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, and to be reconciled with our families, our friends, our neighbors, and our co-workers and fellow students. 
This is nothing short of a modern miracle. When we consider the vicious, hateful, evil world around us with its cancel culture and its critical theories. It's no quarter, take no prisoner, scorched earth ways. I suspect that all of us here have connections and relations and friendships that have been strained, even put asunder by the winner-take-all, revenge-fueled, brook-no-descent attitude that we take for granted since the 2016 election. And if no one has cut you off, maybe you need to look in the mirror and consider who you have cut off. Either way, forgiveness and reconciliation in Jesus' name is the only answer. In your very own everyday life, in your village or town or community, all around you, Jesus' power extends to you to forgive and to restore just as he has forgiven and restored you to new life in him. We're mistaken if we think this sending ministry ends when the twelve return to Jesus in verse 30. It grows by adding and adding and adding villages and disciples until it reaches you and me, and then it grows and adds more in our own everyday lives. Now what happens if we don't feel like it, if we don't want to, if we're afraid of losing our cozy, comfy box seats, if the other people are stupid and voted the wrong way? What happens? Well, the Lord's Prayer is instructive for us. We pray that God's name be hallowed, his kingdom come and his will be done. Now, is that because he needs our help or our reminding just in case he forgets? Of course not. Those things already happen because God says so. In that sense, he doesn't rely on us for them to happen. Rather, we pray that those very things will happen to us, that his name will be holy, that his kingdom will come, that his will be done in our own everyday lives. So it is in this strange story where Jesus doesn't perform many miracles in his own hometown. We pray that we may continue to hear his call to repent and to believe his good news of forgiveness, new life, and salvation, that we not let it pass us by. And furthermore, that we may show and tell others as we move from here out there into the geography of our everyday lives. There's no need to go find some exotic locale as the hippies back in the 60s said, wherever you go, there you are, man. And there Jesus is with you, extending his power to forgive, to grant new life, and to redeem. Having transformed your life, he extends his transforming reach to those in your everyday life too. Amen.